Hello, this is John Thackera speaking to you from France. And I've been trying to figure out two things. Why are all these bad things happening in the world? And is there something practical that designers can do about it? The first question, I have to say, has proved a lot easier to answer than the second one, so I'll keep my first answer short. What's happening is summed up for me in this pair of images. Once all the systems, networks and gadgets of modern life are factored in, the cars, planes, factories, buildings, infrastructure, networks and gadgets of modern life, well, a New Yorker or Londoner today needs about 60 times more energy and resources per person than a hunter-gatherer did, the guy on the left, 10,000 years ago. To put this in a shorter time frame, you and I use more energy and resources in a single month than our great-grandparents did in their whole lifetimes. And we're doing so on a finite planet. So that's the why of my questions. I first heard about these alarming numbers 20 years ago in Amsterdam. I was the new director of the country's first National Design Institute, and this eminent you see on the left, um, Leo Janssen, had agreed to brief me about the latest sustainability research. We're over consuming resources by a factor of 20 times more than the planet can carry, Janssen told me. We need to meet our daily life, everyday needs, using 5% of the energy and material throughputs that we're using now. My jaw must have dropped at that point because he emphasised to me more than once that the numbers were not plucked out of thin air. On the contrary, a global network of scientists had been working on the subject for 30 odd years and the book Limits to Growth, which you can see there, had been published back in 1972. That book, 50 years ago nearly now, contained scenarios about overshoot and collapse of the global system by the middle part of the 21st century, that's to say, any time now. Well, wow, I was impressed by that dramatic number, so I set off to share those dire warnings with the people like yourselves in the design world. I would usually start my talks with some charts and uh, numbers, and I can't break the habit, so here's a new one from just last week. In short, We've emitted the same amount of CO2 in 12 years, from 2010 to 2021, that we emitted from the start of the Industrial Revolution until 1971. Oh my goodness. If you're wondering, what am I supposed to do with that information? Well, join the club. I spent a decade or more after that first meeting with Professor Janssen wagging my finger at various groups of and people like yourselves and saying this cannot go on. But in the absence of guidance from me or anybody else on what practically to do, my dramatic exhortations caused as much shoulder shrugging as anything else and pretty much no change. My proposition that growth is killing the planet, which was repeated by lots of people, also fell flat. It's probably true, but then many people hear the words no growth and think no jobs. Demanding an end to growth, but without addressing people's concerns about jobs and security, was a recipe for the blowback or inertia that we've experienced ever since. For a while, the certainty that we'd never make it to 5% turned me into a confirmed doomer. I dreamed of heading for the hills in a pickup truck filled with peanut butter. But before I could flee, I learned of an explanation why the world found it so easy to ignore the dire warnings of people like Provenza Janssen and his colleagues. This explanation is the existence of a metabolic rift between man and the living world, a kind of ecological amnesia triggered on a mass scale by modern life itself a combination of paved surfaces and pervasive media have shielded us from direct experience of the declining state of the soils, oceans and forests. We read about it or we hear about it on the television, but we don't feel it. 
But here's the thing. I see hope in this explanation. If the problem was separation from nature, then surely we could find ways to fix that. My second reason from hanging in there rather than fleeing for the hills was that I discovered that there's a 5% in future was all around me, everywhere to be seen. Indeed, a big proportion of the world's population meets its daily life needs in radically lighter ways than our own. The diverse ways that poor people meet their daily life needs are usually described as impoverished or backwards. But in 40 years odd now as a guest in what used to be called the developing world, I've come to a startling conclusion. Living sustainably is how people survive when they don't have access to the high entropy support systems of the industrial world. I then began to notice a third thing on my travels. If you add up all the activities that people do and leave aside the abstract counting numbers of GDP, well, 95% of activity all around us is already local, as well as light in its use of resources. The small farm, the corner shop, the doctor's surgery, the builder, the carer, the street trader. Around the world, hundreds of millions of small and medium-sized companies operate within a radius of 50 kilometers of their base or less. Many of these local communities operate at 5% or less of the energy levels needed to run the integrated systems of big cities. Furthermore, and I think this is more important, local people know far more about their place than we rootless, hyper, mobile, modern people do. They can touch, learn about and care for the places where they live. Unlike the abstract words that keep us awake at night, like climate crisis or sustainability, they connect daily with life itself. That's why they call their places so frequently life worlds. So I began to ask, how might we learn from and improve the ways that so-called poor people live? For more than a decade, I sought out those who were creating viable alternatives and presented them as stories in the doors of perception conferences. Stories about real people doing things, I learned, transforms the idea of what seems to be possible. The local in this situation is shaped by um, actions and not by concepts. Then came another realization. A lot of the work that people do locally is unpaid. It doesn't register as GDP at all because it involves care. Care is the essential activity that people have always undertaken to raise and educate their families, cultivate their land and support each other in times of difficulty. Mutual aid goes back basically as far as human civilization goes in one form or another. Whether it's cooking, cleaning, doing laundry, ironing, consoling people, caring for others, listening, in all these activities value arises from relationships and reciprocity, not from things or paid transactions. The consequence of that is that fostering better relationships or creating new connections where there are gaps is one of the main ways that design can contribute in these different situations. These individuals, relationships, groups, networks and cultures make up what Cormac Russell calls associational life. It's how billions of people with low cash incomes meet daily life needs outside the money economy through traditional networks of reciprocity and gifts. They survive and often prosper within social systems that are based on kinship, sharing and myriad different ways to share resources. Now modern healthcare is pretty much an example of the exact opposite. It's a representation of the kind of mess that we've got ourselves into. The United States spends just 2.5% of its vast health care budget, public and private, on public health, that is to say, keeping people healthy, and avoiding preventable diseases and the pre-existing conditions that have mushroomed in recent years. 
Our neglect of public health has contributed to the millions who have died during the pandemic. It looks like an impossible tangle to solve until you shift the frame. Because an amazing thing happens when you re-shift uh, one's window in terms of looking at the care situation. 95% of person-to-person -person care happens outside the biomedical or paid welfare system, in the home and in the community. But this social dimension of care and mutual support receives almost no attention because so much of it is unpaid. It's care. And that's why I propose a language hack at this point. Let's call the world small farmers, parents and cooks who give us good food health professionals, and let's call all those in the world who treat consequences but not causes sickness professionals, might help us to balance up our priorities. The lesson here for local design, health and well-being are not something delivered like a pizza or produced like a car, but there's a huge amount design can still do. Platforms and practical measures can be designed to support the people who already do the bulk of the caring and will continue to do so, from child care to dementia support. I do recommend that you go and learn about poor-to-poor -poor infrastructures in various contexts and then figure out for yourselves how you can improve them. There's always something to be done. And to come back to what I was saying about life places, caring for the health of a place and for the health of the people inside it, ourselves, are part of a single story. That notion alone is transformative about the way we devote our design energies and the priorities that we make. So this brings me on to a second um, set of observations about how people do local. So the framework I've set out is that we need to reduce the uh, material and energy costs of the things that we do by what seems to be impossible, factor 20 or 5 percent. But I've showed you already some examples of where 5 percent solutions are all around us. They happen to be the ways that poor people get by, but my proposition and my experience is there's an incredible amount that we can learn from and be inspired when we look at that. And that one health, place and person is the way to think about our activities. But what has this got to do with the journey back to local? Well, the physicist Ilya Prigozhin put it beautifully, and this is my kind of guiding mantra for change. When a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence have the capacity to shift the entire system. Millions of small-scale experiments and new ways to meet daily life needs are emerging throughout the world now. The opportunity before us is to seek out these projects, these islands of coherence, in our own situation and develop practical ways to help them thrive and interconnect. This is what I do as a writer. I search for small islands of coherence that I can later describe in which social and ecological relationships thrive together. My aim as a curator is similar, only I don't just describe projects I bring them together in embodied encounters so that project leaders can help each other. The design opportunities I'm pointing to here are more brown fields than blue sky, but no less than creative and exciting for that. Help these small islands do better? That's local design. Local design in this context, uh, economic revitalization in the language of policymakers, is a matter of discovery more than inventing things out of your heads or in, in abstract, but it can still be a systematic process. In Preston, for example, you can see here from the small city in England, the city measures where its resources come from for every activity, identifies leakages in the local economy, and it then explores how these leaks can be plugged by locally available resources, people, places, materials, and so on. I could talk for hours about projects that have inspired me in this whole area of the social and ecological interface, but I'll just mention three quickly now more before I move on to the next bit. 
and they're all to do with food, which preoccupies me and I suspect quite a lot of you. So Taobao live streaming, the first example from China, is um, an example of direct contact between farmers in the countryside and the people in the city who grow their food. It's been a dream of people in the food world for two or three generations to reconnect where food comes from, where it's going to. Right now, it's happening thanks to the new networks and something like 300,000 small-scale farmers will be using this platform by the end of the year. My second uh, inspiration is also from China in Shanghai, where this notion of live streaming is transforming where and how people eat. So if you can imagine the kind of the disappearance of restaurants during the pandemic, the notion of pop-up restaurants in back street alleys like this transforms the economics in a big way of where food comes from, who cooks it, and so on. Third example here is um, the vessels that we might use to eat the food or drink the, the drink. Uh, this is from vessels from the Algae Lab at Luma in France. An example of local materials, bio-design, 100% clean and demountable materials being used for basic everyday activities. And then a bonus fourth idea, this uh, open source Internet of Things compost sensor. So the food that we kind of have to throw away or need to recycle can be composted and we can keep an eye on it using the tech. Just kind of quick examples of what is happening out there somewhere if you choose to look, which is transformative of the situation, but which can always be improved by design. And if you want uh, any more examples, um, it's been my stock in trade for a long time. My book contains a large number of similar stories, and you can see the PDF online there if you want to check it out before you buy it and read it. And on the right there are the chapters showing the different kinds of activity that I write about. And the other bunch of examples is uh, from this big show I did just before COVID in China called Urban Rural, with again a list on the right there of all the activities for which I have discovered with my colleagues and friends, examples of people doing things in radically different ways in the real world now. So that's um, a kind of quick dash through the existence of examples of alternatives that are already out there. To recap, in part one, I explained why we need to look for and um, emulate projects that use radically less, 20 times less resources to achieve the same objectives. I've secondly shown you all the people that are doing activities. But for the third and final part, I want to look at the enabling conditions for this work to be done far more widely and continuously and the new skills and practices that designers are going to need and are now acquiring to do it. This chart describes for me the kind of the key essence of the story, which is that for biologists, the health of an ecosystem lies in the vitality of interactions between its component species. And for me, this lesson applies equally to a locality, to a place. The process enabling diverse stakeholders together to work together. This lesson applies equally to a locality. The process that enables diverse stakeholders to work together is a key success factor. This chart, which uh, comes from, yeah, not so long after I met Professor Janssen, and we call it the Mayflower chart, describes for me what local design is mostly about. The activities that people are doing and that you can also begin to master. Scanning and mapping is key. Identify opportunities for local provisioning. Search for neglected value, overlooked people, places and practices. Discover what's already there and explore what could be if certain things were changed. Keep a track of where resources come from. Identify leakages. Explore ways to remove those leakages using local skills and resources. Explore ways to plug those gaps using local skills and resources. The words convene and curate describe all the activities that uh, we need to get really good at to help diverse groups of people work together. 
A variety of different stakeholders in any locality needs to work together, formal and informal, big and small. But the question, it's a design question for me, is how do we help that happen? All over the world, we are kind of suffering from people not talking to each other, not collaborating, not being able to share. And so for me, designing the process by which groups work together is just as important as deciding what needs to be done, if not more so. So I use the word curator here to describe people who enable relationships between projects, places and, and individuals, because their work is connective. As collaboration experts, people who connect people, their most valuable skills are hosting, convening, facilitating. You can learn these skills on courses online or in local groups, the art of invitation, the art of hosting. Go and check. These are going to be the most important skills you probably need to add going forwards. The light bulb here shows the extraordinary range of new social and business models that have emerged in recent times. All sorts of creative and very brainy people, as well as social movements, finding new ways to exchange value in the, that are not exploitative and not ecological damaging. I can't possibly go into all of these now. Be aware only that they exist. And this brings me on to this word, knowledges, because the main point I'm trying to make here is that local is more complicated, more diverse, more varied than the global. Global solutions, global services, global activities have to even things out. They cannot operate specific to each condition. And once we then say that the local is where value lies and the local is where we're going to focus, then all sorts of new knowledges need to be required. Social and ecological contexts are complex. The closer you get to a local situation, the greater the diversity of ways to learn about it, to know it. This is a positive because in nature, diversity is healthier than control or uniformity. But it does mean that there will be no universal solution for you to apply in your design work. On the contrary, you're going to have to get used to working with all sorts of people with expertise that may be new to you. And learning how to do that is pretty central. At the kind of longest term basis, learning how to explore the geology of a place because it's deep time, it's kind of million year evolution, in ways that we're only beginning to understand shapes how it behaves. So from deep time to the microscopic, this is coral seen through new technology for the first time in its beauty and detail. 95% of the life in this world is invisible. So if we're going to be designing for life and designing for life worlds, this is whole extraordinary sort of universe of knowledge and wonder to get to grips with. But once you get into the practical business of restoration of places, regenerative economies, ecological kind of uh, practical, hands-on, earthy work, then again, all sorts of new skills um, are involved. Many disciplines are involved in ecological restoration. These two, for example, are taking soil samples and on the left, you can see in that list from the Climate Tech Wiki, just some of the dozens, hundreds of technologies and tools available for them to draw on. Restoration may also need the geographer's knowledge of the territory, a biologist's expertise in habitats, or the economist's need to um, measure flows and leakages of money in the locality. The local economy reveals its greatest potential when we take inspiration from skills and practices that may already be there, but overlooked. This is the kind of contents list of a local trade school here in France, showing some skills and practices that I didn't even know existed. Everywhere that we go, there will be people, maybe just a memory, but maybe somebody with an old practice and expertise that we can reconnect with and restore in some way or another. Deep ecological knowledge is a feature of indigenous cultures around the world. <clears throat> in Australia, indigenous peoples have cared for place as a commons for at least 50,000 years. There are an estimated 3,000 different words for sharing in African cultures. 
And in Latin America, alternatives to development words include the concepts of buen vivir, living well, and planes de vida, planning for life. These visionary cultures that have a totally different set of priorities and ways of being in the world can be inspirational for us, but we need to correct directly with the people who understand them. The best available knowledge is not just found in scientific literature or even in technical universities, but amongst the local stewards and makers such as fishermen, farmers, bird watchers, anyone, in other words, who interacts with their hands and bodies with ecosystems on a day-to-day -day basis. Local stewards hold fine-grained knowledge about ecosystems and social ecological interactions. We need to ask for any place who has answered a similar question in the past? How might we learn from or piggyback on what worked before? A lot of these knowledges have the potential to enrich what we mean by Green New Deal. Looking at a place rather than abstract words frames the range of possible resources that we have to, dry, to, to draw on. Ever since water was shared as a common resource in Iran 8,000 years ago, People in places have been able to collaborate and share resources to raise and educate their families and care for the land. The mutualization of risk and mutual security, as I said before, amongst traditional networks of reciprocity and gift, uh, dates back centuries. So the journey back to local is going to involve acquiring new kinds of knowledge or finding people who know it and working with them, bringing different groups together, all sorts of skills and practices that are not typical to the normal design project. So as we change our ways of working, framed by place and collaborating in new ways, we need new sorts of infrastructure, which I like to call social infrastructure, that will take precedence over the concrete kind. When it comes to helping a variety of different actors and stakeholders to work together, platform cooperatives, as they're called in particular, or a great way to provide fair compensation for services provided by the people who actually do the services. Social infrastructure is mainly soft skills, but it will need places. And here again, the challenge is not to build large numbers of new concrete structures, but to reuse and reanimate things that are already there. A surprising number of institutions already exist that we used in the previous transition before the Industrial Age. There are more public libraries in the US, for example, 120,000, than there are McDonald's. Regional and speciality museums around the world are looking to redefine their roles. Thousands of post offices and local shops already act as meeting points in local communities. This lesson has not been lost in China, where JD.com, one of the big networks, is opening 1,000 real-world local stores per day. So if JD.com can see potential in local spots, so can the rest of us. I think I'll need to draw it to a close. Three takeaways from my talk about the journey back to local. Firstly, local provision is not a design or a lifestyle choice. It's where we're headed anyway, because local uses time, space and energy in radically less wasteful ways. Takeaway two, the vast majority of economic activity to meet daily life needs is already local. Changing the word faster to closer is not as hard as it sounds. And actually, as I hope I've given you a sense of, it's fun, exciting and just where the future lies. And then thirdly, restoring our own health and caring for place is part of a single story. It's not lots of different things to do. I wish you every success on your journey back to the local.